Okay, we're recording. Can everybody hear me okay? Ah, yes, sir. Yes. Good morning. Couldn't hear you, though. Good morning. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Okay, thanks, Ahmed. All right, let me uh, we'll share the screen. So here's the syllabus. Today is the 10th. Tomorrow is 9-11. Uh, anyway, we'll uh, we'll review. Uh, so we're supposed to be reviewing logic design starting today, uh, but I, I still have probably have to steal this day from uh, the logic design review. But we'll, we'll probably have plenty of time to get through it. Uh, and then we'll do logic design uh, Monday, uh, Wednesday, and Friday of next week, which will be 13, 15, 17. And then we'll do Monday the following week, and then we'll do the test on that Wednesday. And then we'll chart chapter three that Friday. So uh, so all next week we'll be reviewing logic design. And so today, well, maybe, probably not today, all next week and Monday, and then the test on uh, the 22nd. Uh, I don't think, you know, you, you shouldn't have too much trouble with this because we have been through it and this will be just a good review and the test is fairly straightforward. Uh, all right, um, okay. And then, let's see, let me get rid of this. Okay, there's where we kind of left off. So, um, so we can write our code at different levels of abstraction. So we talk about structural and behavioral. So when what we tr ideally, we, we like to write things at the behavioral level because it's a higher level, takes less time. Uh, the synthesis tools are getting better and better. And generally you can write at the behavioral level and get what you want, but sometimes you need to go down and have a little more uh, control uh, where you have you actually want to specify um, gates and and uh, and and how things are connected, and so um, so sometimes we'll use this, but normally we're going to try and be at the highest level we can get by with. So there's some there's some do's and don'ts, and we've I've talked about a lot of these, uh, but let's just review some of them. So when uh so uh your sensitivity list has to be either all edge triggered or uh levels it can't you can't mix level signals with edge triggered signals and so uh if you're intending uh, sequential logic you normally want to have the signals preceded by the pause edge and neg edge keywords one or the other um you generally want to use non-blocking assignments when you're doing sequential always blocks, although there are times when it when it might be desirable to use a blocking statement, but probably you wouldn't do all blocking. You probably just do uh, an you know an occasional blocking, um, and generally you shouldn't mix blocking and non-blocking in the same block. But even that's actually okay. Uh, if you're if you're doing a sequential design, there are times when you might have all your statements sequential, except you might have a blocking statement or maybe a group of sequential state, a group of non-blocking statements, a blocking statement, another group of non-blocking and a blocking. Sometimes that actually works out to be uh, desirable. Uh, be really careful about uh, assigning the same variable in two different always blocks because then there'll be competition and there'll be fighting. And then you wanna avoid unwanted latches when you're writing an always block to do uh, sequential logic uh, sorry to do combinational logic so when you're using this always block in this bastardized manner where it's going to result not in a sequential design with a clock but it's going to result in in just standard combinational logic in those cases you want to be very careful to uh to do a couple of you want to make sure that that um you assign values to all possible execution paths so uh in, if you have an if statement, you should you should uh, you should have all the else is and even an else at the end. You should have all cases in a case statement and probably even have a default case at the end, just to be sure. And uh, and sorry. and you should uh, and you should unconditionally assign default values at the beginning of the always block. Okay, um, so let's moving on here. Um, 
So I'm going to get rid of this one. And we'll do this one. Okay, so now we're, uh, now we're going to cover um, wires and registers, arrays, loops, and Verilog, and testing the Verilog module. Okay. So, um, so remember, wires act as a real wire. Uh, regs, the registers, uh, they actually st store information. So you can think of wires like wires, registers like flip-flops. And the declarations for wire and registers ought to be done inside the, uh, should be done inside the module, but outside any initial or always block. So you don't, you don't define, you don't declare signals inside the always block. Uh, the initial value of, of a wire, if it's, if it's not uh, connected, if, it, if, if the, what it's connected to the output's not defined, then it'll be, it'll be listed as, uh, as, um, as undefined as uh, disconnected, high Z, whereas the initial value of a register is X. Um, and then the wires are data types that can be used on the left-hand side of an, an assigned statement. So we've said this, the left-hand side of an assigned statement must be a wire. The left-hand side of a, of a assignment statement inside an always block must be, uh, must be a register type. And that's true even if you're using the, reg the, the always block in that bastardized manner to result in combinational logic. And then the synthesizer will take your register and it won't create the register. It'll treat it as a wire in the end. But, uh, but in order for you to write the code, you, you, the syntax will, you'll get a syntax error if you don't declare it as a register. Okay, so here's, here's a combinational example of a wire and a register. So here's module wire reg combination ABF. So we have an input A and B and an output F. A and B are wires and the output uh, F is a register. Now, just a point here, you can't define these inputs as registers. So, it, and it makes sense. Why, why the, these A and B, how, how are they being driven? They're being driven externally. So, to make them a register doesn't really make any sense because if they if they're the input to a flip flop, uh, then uh, how does it get latched in? Where's the clock? I mean, that, it doesn't make any sense. So so things that come into a module are driven from the outside of the module. So as they come into the module, they just come in on a wire. That's one way you can think of it. You you there's it, it would be improper to think of it as a flip flop giving these signals because. Inside the module, they're being driven ex from an external source, which could be a flip-flop externally. That's fine. But internally, they just have to be wires. The output can be a wire and it can be a register. That's, that's okay. Um, all right. So we have an always block, A or B. What do you notice here? Are these edge or level? They're level signals. All right. And it's using the old notation of an or. I prefer a comma, but either one's legal. Then we have our begin and end inside the always block. F equals the, the bitwise inversion of the bit, the bit signal A. You could also use the exclamation point. And you have the bitwise and. You could use the logical and. But again, I think this is better. This is, this is what you're intending. And so, you, it's, so it's A prime and with B. And that's the end of the module. So what, what does the synthesizer do? The synthesizer does not, even though F is defined as a register, it doesn't result as a register. What it results as is an AND gate and no flip-flop. Okay, so that's what the synthesizer would make. This just becomes an AND gate. All right, now here's, here's a sequential logic example of a wire and a register. So here we have clock, reset, D, Q out. Uh, we have an input clock, a reset and a D and an output Q out. Now, again, the inputs have to be wires and the output can be defined as a register. And in this case, it is. In this case, we defined it as a register, but it didn't result in a register. All right, and then here's our always block. Notice what do we have here? Edge signals, old designation with the or, couldn't just use a comma. And then begin and end, if reset, so if reset is true, which means high, 
So that's obviously a, a, an active high reset. Then Q out equals zero. Otherwise, Q out equals D. Where does D come from? D is driven by some external source. It's in our port list as an input, and it's a wire. All right, and then the end module. Notice the left-hand side, Q out, has to be a register, and it is. And we have, we have an if statement and an else, so that's good. Uh, all right, so what does this do? This, may, this is going to make a D flip-flop with an active high reset. All right. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Martin. Sure, go ahead. Uh, can you go back to the previous page? How is uh, clock and reset uh, both post edge? I, I understand the, the clock is uh, a post edge signal, but why is the reset post edge not a level signal? But, okay, well, two things. One, remember in the sensitivity list in the always block uh, in, in Vivado, they must both be edge signals. Yes. You can't mix them. And so you, uh, in theory, I guess you 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 could uh, you could put reset as a level, but you're going to get a syntax error in Vivado. That may be legal with other synthesizers, but the point is, when do you want reset to actually take effect? When it rises from low to high, and then as long as it's high, the flip flop's just going to stay in its reset state. So, okay, so uh, by uh, adding post edge right before a signal, you basically change it from level signal into post edge yeah right in okay. other words in other words so so reset can be out there varying you know going from zero to one and back to zero and up to one and all this says this always block will only execute on the rising edge of reset okay okay makes sense now thank you so much sure all right constants we've talked about constants a little bit already remember so we have tick define uh Oh, so this is, yeah, so this is, if you want to specify a constant, you can, you can give it a name and then a value, and then anywhere in your program, you can use the constant name. So for instance, uh, you could have pi and then 3.14159, whatever. Uh, of course, that's a floating point number, not a, not a bit variable. Not, so, um, so, we precede this with the tick define. You'll see a lot of the compiler directives are, are start with a tick, tick define or apostrophe, whatever you want to call that. But we, we usually say tick define, constant name, constant value. And uh, it's one of the compiler directives to define a number or an expression or, of a, or a, it can also be a string. And uh, anywhere you see the constant name, it just replaces it with the defined value here uh, in, in, the, uh, in the compiler. And this happens at compile time, not at runtime. So they, these are not variables. Once you've compiled your program, these constants are already embedded and they never change. The values are in the programs, not the constant names anymore. All right. Um, we also have parameters. Now there's a, there's a significant difference between a parameter and a constant. Uh, and the parameter is that it can be changed when you instantiate a module. So, so, so the constant would appear in a module, the parameter would appear in a module. This tick defined constant is always the same value. And when you instantiate the module, every time it has the same value. The parameter has a default value that you can set but you're allowed to change it every time you instantiate it. So Verilog can define constant values in a module using the parameter, and it can be used to customize each module instance or instantiation. The parameter value can be changed at module instantiation, or you can also use this def parm statement, and you can change it. Uh, uh, you can change it. Uh, uh, globally for the, for the, uh, for the, uh, by, well, you can put the def farm statement in a different file, even than the file where the module exists. And the def farm statement will reference the, the, that instantiation using the unique instantiation number and, and the, uh, and, and the, uh, and the module in which it's instantiated 
has a unique name too. So it can also, it'll use that. So even if it's nested, you know, several layers deep, the def farm statement can reference it and change that parameter by putting this def farm statement wherever you want. Uh, def farm statements are dangerous because you can, they can be, they can be, they can be in in some file that's uh, that's you know fairly far away from this module instantiation, but it reaches in and changes a parameter value, and it can be very hard to find a, an error or a problem related to that. There, so there are some organizations that uh, outlaw def farm statements just for that reason because they they can be really they can be they can be tricky. Um, Again, all this happens at compile time and not runtime. And then there's uh, this thing called local param. It's like a parameter, but it, but it cannot be directly changed at module instantiation. The local parameter can be used to find constants that should not be changed. And again, happens at compile time, not runtime. So it's, it's really, it's really pretty pretty similar to the tick defined constant. Okay, arrays. How do we do arrays? Okay, so there there are two positions to declare the array bounds. You can declare it on the left hand side, which is what we typically do. And so this the register variable eight bit register can store one bit by eight bit vector information like this, and we usually do high to low so that we get it organized with the high bit here and the low bit there, because that's how we think about it. That's how it makes sense to us. Okay. But you can also define after the variable. And in this case, we have 16, we have an array of 16 8-bit bytes. Now, in this case, they, they did the array 15 to zero, but a lot of times we'll do it zero to 15. It doesn't really matter, but logically, usually the first value is not 15. The first value is usually zero when you have a column of, of, of eight bit bytes. So you have 16 registers, each register can store one byte. So here's where we each, we're basically the, the, uh, specifying the, the word length and here we're specifying the number of words. So that's this is how we typically define arrays. So here's a multi-dimensional array. So here's a here's a uh, a four by three array. So we have four rows and three columns. So row column, and each location within that is a three bit vector is a four bit vector. So that's why they can have values as big as 12 or even 15, actually. And we, we can also initialize it using the, using the brackets and the, and the commas. So uh, each group within brackets is a row. All the elements and the, and, the, and the rows are separated by commas. And finally, the whole thing is bracketed. And you can get at one of these four bit values by specifying array element matrix A31. So that would be row three, column one. Again, remember the columns, the rows are labeled zero, one, two, three, and the columns are labeled zero, one, two. So three, one would be zero, one, two, three, column zero, one. So that would be three, one. All right, um, we'll go through the, these examples uh, fairly quickly here. So uh, we can use Verilog to represent a parity generator uh, using a lookup table. Now, uh, I've already mentioned this, but uh, in, in, the, in, our, in our chip that we're using, uh, our Artrix 7 chip, 7 series chip, this Artrix chip, uh, it is is the logic elements in it are pretty much lookup tables and multiplexers and flip flops. That's it. There there aren't there there and then there are some gates which allow us to chain uh, some of our logic slices together. And we'll talk about those. They're carry chains and there's a logic chain. Uh, 
but basically we don't have it's not a we don't have a huge amount of AND gates that we can connect, connect to OR gates or anything like that. Uh, we mostly have lookup tables. And that's how we mostly implement uh, the, the logic. And, and there are LUT sevens and they can be combined together. You can take uh, two slices and make, uh, I guess each slice has two LUT sevens, I think, and you can combine those and get, make a LUT eight even. So, so uh, in this case, uh, most of the most of most of the slides were done uh, based on uh, a, a LUT six implementation, so you'll start to see that as we go through the rest of this book. So you can use very large representative parity generator using lookup tables. We have a four bit input and a five bit output. So so basically we're we're we're, set, we're transmitting four bits, and we're going to append the fifth bit to it that will be a parity bit. And we're going to use odd parity. So what we do, we have to count up the number of ones in our four-bit data nibble. And then if there's an even number, we have to make our we append a fifth bit that's a one. If there's an odd number of ones, we append a fifth bit that's a zero. And that makes our final five bits that we're going to transmit. So our output corresponds to each input. Uh, plus the appended fifth bit to create uh, an odd number of ones. And what we can do, we can, we can store all this in a lookup table so that, uh, so that we put in the four bits and the five bits automatically come out. And here's how it looks. So here's our four bit input. And as you could imagine, there are uh, 16 possible inputs, zero through 15. And so this one, the appended bit would have to be a one. This one, the appended bit would have to be a zero. This one, the appended bit would have to be a one. And this one, the appended bit should be a zero, but actually there's an error in the table uh, and they put a one. Um, uh, two mistakes. So you should be able to find them. That's one of them, obviously. And where there are two zeros in a row, actually every other row obviously has to be one zero, one zero. So when you don't see that pattern, that's, an, that's the other mistake. Uh, um, yeah, let's see. Even odd. Oh, th there's several odds. Never mind. I was wrong about that. All right. So there's even. That should be a one. That's the other mistake. All right. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Um, so. So. So if we had, um, all right, well, all right. So LUT6 content for MUX4. So note, note in, so we, when we did lab, uh, let's see, I think we're doing lab two uh, next week. So lab two problem is synthesized to a LUT6 with six inputs. Uh, so yeah, I uh, let's see. Uh, so what would, so basically we want to implement a MUX4. Mux so how do you implement a MUX4 with a six variable lookup table? Well, let's, let's think about that for a second. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn this on. And Okay. All right. So, so here's our, so here's our mux four. F out, and then I zero, I one, I two, and I three, and we have two inputs. We'll call them A and B. Uh, two select lines. So all total, there's six inputs, one output. All right, so so we want to do a LUT6. Well, our LUT6 has uh, six inputs, A, B, C, D, E, and F. So we can make it this A, this can be B, these two right here, and then we can do I3, I2, I1, and I0. And then finally we have a 
our output f. So of course, how many rows are you going to have with with in a lot six? So you're going to have two to the sixth rows. So we'd have 16 with four, 32 with five, 64 with with uh, six. So there are going to be 64 rows. So I'm not going to draw 64 rows, but uh, but the idea is we need to figure out. Uh, well, of course, the, the rows here are just ordered, obviously, in straight binary order. So what's the what's the output for f? And uh, so that's what we're that's what we're going to figure out. All right. So let me shrink that down. So what would the let contents look like? So here are here are four ends and our AB. Well, they did it in slightly different order. Now, uh, in this case, we have a bunch of don't cares, so that shrinks the number of rows. Um, so if if A and B are zero. We're selecting our zero input. I, I wrote them in a different order, but uh, yeah, I guess I should have written them like this. So A and B select for this. So if we're selecting for input zero, we don't care what input one, two, and three are. So that condenses our number of rows quite a bit. Um, if, we're, if A and B are zero, one, we're selecting for I and one. If A and B are one, zero, we're selecting for I and two. And finally, if they're one, one, we're selecting for I and three. So we can describe this with these don't cares, which, uh, which shrinks our number of rows to eight rows. And, uh, and so, so, uh, so we would still have to expand this when we put this into our LUT six, we're still gonna have 64 rows. But what happens is you have to populate these. So, so this row would actually be zero, 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 uh, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 uh, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, and so forth. You would actually have each one of these rows uh, expands into eight rows on its own to flush out these don't cares because there are three don't cares. So that's eight possible ways they can they can exist. So each one of these rows is really represents eight rows, but they result in the exact same outputs because these don't matter. But you can write it in this shorthand notation. All right, let, let me stop there. Probably somebody has questions about that. Does that make sense? So a good little exercise to do it just to take a few of these rows and pretend that you're writing all 64 rows for this lookup table and and just make sure you get you know you know do enough of them that you understand clearly how, how the final 64 row uh, lookup table would actually look one output y 64 rows with six inputs and you can order them however you want i i think it makes sense to order them a b here because otherwise these rows are all shuffled uh, and and I think it makes sense to do in three two one zero lower lower order, but whatever. Okay, um, so here's the parity code generator. Uh, so we have input x and y. X is our four bit vector. That's that we're that's input, and then we're going to output a five bit vector with the parity bit appended, and we're guaranteeing that this that this code should always give. Uh, this output y should always have the original data x plus the appended fifth bit that guarantees we'll have an odd number of ones. Okay. And so we put this, so uh, we have we have an internal uh, an internal wire. So our x and y wires are they uh, uh, registers? Somebody tell me. Looking at the code. Why? They're all wires because they're not defined as registers. So they're all wires. And we already know then this is this is going to be a combinational uh, uh, circuit. It's going to be purely combinational. No clock, uh, no memory elements required. 
And in this case, we did not use an always block. We just use our assigned statements. Now notice here we have this parameter and, and our parameter is called OT and it's 16 bits. And here they are, we've gone ahead and defined them. And we've used this full uh, constant designation here, one tick B1. So it's one zero zero one zero one one zero zero one one zero one zero zero one, which is uh, exactly uh, this column over here. Okay, it's that it's that parity bit for for these. Uh, we have sixteen possible combinations of four bits, and that's the sixteenth bit. I mean the fifth bit that gives us an odd number with the two errors corrected, hopefully. All right, and then here's the way it works. We, uh, we say parity bit, which is in our internal signal, equals, uh, equals our, uh, equals uh, this, uh, this parameter, which is a 16, it's, a, it's, a, it's an array, it's a one bit array of 16 one bit values. So we take OT, we index it by our, uh, our initial value X, which is a four bit vector. And it's gonna select one of these 16 bits and it, it'll select the one, the, it'll select the correct one that will, that will give us the right parity bit, zero or one. And all we did again, this, all we did, this OT array just has this array here with these two things corrected, obviously. And then we have the output Y, which is our output here. So our input X just indexes our parameter and our output Y uh, takes X, which, which is the four bit input and comma appends parity bit, which gets assigned right here. And it's just gonna be one of these. So for instance, Let's say our input value for X is uh, 1010, zero, one, zero, okay? Well, if we look up here, 1010, the, uh, the parity bit should be a one. So that would be, that would be, uh, that would be A, so, so a 10. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay, there's our one. So when we have OT indexed at, by 10, we pull up this one right here, and then we set that equal to parity bit. And then we take our input X again and append it to parity bit and set it equal to our output Y. And that's it, we're done. And that, that gives us, uh, since, it, since we have uh, 1010 as our input, uh, we append a one and that gives us three ones in our final five bit vector output Y. So it's odd parity. All right. And uh, let's see, loop. So we do have these things called forever loops uh, where you can do uh, begin and end and it'll do this. This would be used in a test bench to generate a clock. We would never, we would never do this uh, in our code. One, because we can't, we can't, these, these parameter, these, uh, uh, Inertial delays don't mean anything uh, outside of a test bench because we can't synthesize some delay that we want. Uh, it is whatever the hardware does. And also it would be, it, it wouldn't work very well. Um, and you have to give an initial value in your, uh, uh, in your test bench. Otherwise, if you don't set clock equal to one, then um, what happens is uh, this, uh, you would just be uh, inverting unknown or high Z, depending on, well, I guess it's so, uh, um, whether it's a wire or a register. So the example is only useful in test bench. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, we do have a few more, not too many more. Okay, let's see if we can maybe get through this. Okay, so we have loops in Verilog. So remember, unlike in C language, we don't have we don't have these plus plus and minus minus operators in Verilog. So you so if you want to uh, have a for loop, that's fine. 
but you have to write out I equals I plus one. You can't do I plus plus. And, but you can use for loops, but uh, uh, yeah, you can do those. And yeah, so no plus plus. So the for loops, um, well, we can do while loops too, but remember for loops and while loops wind up having to be in all these blocks, our initial blocks. And they're often used in test benches, but, but they can be in all these blocks in your regular code too. So here's a, so here's a while loop while counts less than tick max. What is this tick max? Tick, tick max is a defined constant up here. Tick define max 100. So wherever you put tick max, it the compiler substitutes 100. So this is count less than 100, begin. And then uh, count equals count plus one. And it just keeps running until it uh, gets to 100 and then it drops through. This dollar display, that's a compiler directive, only useful in always blocks. And it's just gonna print that number to your, to your, uh, in, your in your test bench output window. Uh, Dr. Morton, is a tick like a pointer? Uh, no, it's just a, it's just syntax. It's just uh, when, when it, we do tick define, then when you actually put max in your code, you put tick max. So just syntax. Okay, thank you. And again, test bench use. Not any, you know, can't use this in regular code. Uh, here you can do a repeat. You can repeat parenthesis eight, and it repeats this, this set of instructions eight times. Okay, how to test the very log code. We'll, we'll go through this pretty quickly because uh, I have to go in and, uh, from micro lab here in just a minute. How to test your very log code. Well, so, your test bench can be complex or simple. Now, a really great example of a fairly complex test bench is the one you used in your first laboratory. And I, uh, the one that was in the CAN lab to kind of show you how Vivado works, you should go back and look at that and re go through it a bunch of times until you understand every line in that test bench. And it may take you a little while. We probably haven't talked about all the things there. So there's still some things that, that aren't gonna make sense. But that's a very that's a pretty complex test bench. You don't have to write them that complex for this course, but you should see, uh, you know, how they did that. Um, we'll work. We'll we'll lean more towards the simple test benches. The whole idea of a test bench is to help debug your design and to save you time and money. So if you spend a lifetime on a complex test bench, you're probably wasting time and money potentially. You need to make it complex enough that it's going to help you. Uh, simple enough that you can get it done in a reasonable amount of time so the test bench itself doesn't become a sinkhole for money and time. Um, test bench are very different from the synthesis process. You can do all sorts of stuff in the test bench you can't synthesize. And uh, uh, in general, we use our initial blocks primarily in test benches. But when, you're, when you are writing very log code uh, uh, for FPGAs, you do have some latitude to use initial blocks in your regular code because you do write the 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 file the, the bit file gets written into the into the uh, into the FPGA where you can set some initial values and uh, only in the test bench do you get to use uh, the propagation and, and inertial delays they don't have any use outside of the test bench. Here's the test bench that you had in your tutorial. And I'm not going to go through it because I, I may come back and do this some other day because I, I, I'm running out of time. But uh, so first off, it sets a time scale, tick time scale. Again, remember, all these compiler directives typically start with a tick. And you almost always have to have tick time scale in your code. One nanosecond with one picosecond uh, granularity. Then the module name, tutorial, and then the module tutorial. Uh, then, then the module... Yeah, uh, yeah. And so anyway, remember then, uh, you're gonna have in here, um, you don't pass any 
there's no parameter, there's no signals passed, no signals returned, uh, because the test bench is all internal. And then somewhere in here, you have to put in your module under test. In this case, it's a, uh, um, yeah, it, it is, it is your, uh, uh, tutorial. Okay, and you read in, in, in that module you're testing, you're going to read in some LEDs and you're going to, or you're going to read in switches and read out LEDs. Uh, notice here they're using the dot notation. Okay, so they're not using positional notation. So the, the signals in, in the test bench are, are these, uh, are, are these, uh, is the, is the LED. And the actual signal we're passing is LEDs. And here's switches. SWT, we're going to use in, in here. Switches is a signal we're passing. And we define those up here. And then, uh, so, so notice here there's a function. We haven't even talked about function definitions yet, except very briefly. And uh, so we've, def we've defined the function. And then here's our actual test bench. And we're going to use our function in, in the test bench. So uh, we have an initial block, begin, and then we're going to do this for loop. We're going, not going to count by ones. We're going to count by twos, which is fine. So we're going to go 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and so forth, as long as it's less than 255. So we'll go up to 254, and then we'll quit. Then we're going to delay 50 nanoseconds, uh, and we're going to set switches equal to i. So uh, so i then, the i is this integer. And, um, and so this, this integer has some value, right? 0 to, to 254 counting by twos. It's our index in our for loop. So initially switches will be all zero. Then switches will be uh, a zero. Well, uh, we have how many switches? Eight switches. So then switches will be zero, 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 one, zero. That'll be the first value or the second value. First value, all zero. Second value, you know, all zeros except the one in the bit one position and so forth. And it'll count all the way up to 255 or 254, which I guess will give us ones pretty much everywhere. All right, so, so we, do, we delay here for 50 nanoseconds, set the switches equal to I. Then for 10 nanoseconds, our expected LEDs should equal expected LED switches. Now, this, uh, this function is named expected LED. And we haven't talked about functions yet, so we'll just let this go for now. But so this is your challenge. Uh, I want you to, you can look at it now, see how much sense you can make. The red is the function definition, and then the blue is the actual rest of the test bench. Um, and here's some things that gets printed out. And basically what it does, it puts in a value uh, for the switches, and then it checks the outputted LED uh, values to make sure that they're what we expected. And here's how we define the expected. And we define the expected for all the various combinations. All right, so anyway, uh, let's see. I think I'm gonna talk about functions on, uh, on Monday. So just a reminder, uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going to be in class on Monday. And uh, I, you have to look at the uh, ASAP and see where the class is. I thought it was in the engineering building, but uh, it turns out the micro class isn't. So I suspect it's probably the same. We're probably not there for this one either. So I don't know where we are. So I'll look at look at ASAP. Uh, I'd like everybody to show up on Monday. I'm thinking about giving everybody a free bonus uh, one course point for showing up at the first in-person lecture. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I'll send out an email this weekend. Uh, but plan on being uh, being there on Monday. Be there or be square. All right, I'll give you a quick two seconds for questions and I need to take off. And I, uh, I, will, I will post this recording, but I probably won't get it posted till later today when I get back from UTSA. Uh, Dr. Martin, according to uh, 
uh, the syllabus. It's in EB020406. Yeah, I thought that's where it was, but you, you better look at ASAP because they may have changed it. They changed the micro one. Oh, so it's not in the syllabus, it's in ASAP. What do you mean like in ASAP? Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Take one minute to do this. Okay, so here, if we go into here, and we go into UTSA. Now, they you used to not have to log on, but now you do have to log on for some reason. ASAP. And I guess you probably have to log on too. I have to log on now. And then you go down here, faculty services. Uh, Look up classes. Fall 2021. Electrical engineering. Thirty-five sixty-three. Search the schedule. Digital system design, Monday with your party. Okay, it is EB20406. EB That's what they're still saying. Okay, so it's it's in the big lecture room and the engineering building. Good. They they moved the micro one though. So all right. No problem. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. All right. We will see you guys on Monday. Well, and uh, yeah, see you guys on Monday.